Welcome to episode nine of the Science of Advertising show, the show where we disclose the advertising secrets that brands use to influence and persuade human behavior. On today's show, we have Dr. Jared Cooney Horvath, the preeminent expert of his field of educational neuroscience with a focus on memory formation, learning, and attention, and your host, Jonathan Rowley. Welcome, Dr. J. Oh, thank you. Number nine. We were almost to double digits. This is going crazy. It is. Oh, bring it well, on. And welcome to the COVID hair as well. It is impressive. Still not getting better. I saw, I, I was, I had to drive to the store yesterday and I saw a sign that said haircuts and I thought, oh, sweet, like black market haircuts. No, it, they were, they were still closed. Then it said COVID closed. So nothing. I'm I got like my hopes up for a moment there. Just pulled out the kitchen scissors and had a, had a red hot crack at that. I'm thinking about it, but I, I'm too scared. I'll just let it keep going. It kind of looks like Kevin Costner from uh, Dances with the Wolves. Okay, that's one way to look at it. But, uh, <laughs> mate, we've got a big show today. And uh, I think there's a bit of a theme that may emerge. Hmm. First up, we have a new creative that's straight out. And it's a relatively new brand as well. Um, and it's from a, a men's health brand called Mosh. So I'm really keen to get your thoughts on this one because it's an interesting piece of content. So here's the 30 second creative from Mosh. Come on, guys, it's time to lift. You're just not performing like you used to. I mean, where have you been lately? Not here. At Mosh, we're all about men's health made easy. Chat to Aussie doctors to treat sexual health, hair loss, skin care, and mental health. It's all online, discreet, and affordable and the treatments get delivered to your door. Right, Doc? That's right. Head to getmosh.com.au. The latest from Mosh. There we have it. Dr. J, do you want to take it? Am I going to have it? Where are we going to go? Let me just, I'll, 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 let, me, let me kick this one off here for you. So it's funny because last week we were talking about um, a weird ad where you could have split the beginning and the end completely. There was like a running joke. It was the one where they were pumping gas and he tried to, to land it right on the 20. Sense mark, what was it? Um, fucking twenty dollar was yeah, homeloans.com. Homeloans.com. So you're in kind of a similar boat here where you've got a joke at the beginning and then you've got the product at the end. But where this separates itself from that last week's one is the joke is directly relevant to the product in this case. It's not just a random joke and now, hey, homeloans.com. The joke is about penises and the product is about penises in addition to other things. So actually this was an example of using how you can split an ad into two. So long as that front end a is attention grabbing. And in this case, if you're trying to get guys to think about their junk and their health, you probably comedy is not a bad way to go in, but you take that comedy and that leads directly into what your product is going to be and say, so I actually think compared to last week's version of this, I think they they handled that joke into reality transition much smoother. Yeah, look, I, I totally agree. I, I think they've done a brilliant job. I really like this creative. Again, the first eight, nine seconds is the joke. The reason I like this, this style is several reasons. One, it's locker room. So it immediately screams, guys, you know, yeah. that's the sporting mindset as well. And mind you, most of the TV or a lot of TV and the big audience from TV comes from sporting type of programs. So it will also slot quite nicely in terms of their media strategy. But slight humor, you know, blow up penises, you know, going a little bit soft, gets your attention regardless. But then it's a nice segue. And I really like the segue. But the, the, the thing I really love about this ad, where it works, you've got my attention, you've, you've got me, then what are you going to do with it? You have a trusted advisor as such, even though he's more like the patient, but he's a young, vibrant male that you can associate with. But then they transition to the doctor as well. And he presents sharp as attack. And this goes back to getting the right talent is yeah. crucial to the setup. Like the doctor's warm, he's friendly. He's also demonstrating the service, which is a video call. So you've kind of got this sequence of events that, that, uh, that tells the story as it needs to be told. This particular strategy is a very traditional direct response style ad. So what do you mean? Go, go deeper. So a direct response ad is the structure really starts with a grabber. You've got to get attention. 
a grabber usually could be three to four seconds because literally 80 cents in the dollar is spent in the first three to five seconds. Because if you don't have attention there, the rest of the ad mean is it doesn't mean anything or you can't do anything with it because you don't have attention. Then you go through pain pleasure or problem solution. So in this particular one, it was problems in the bedroom was actually the problem they highlighted or a, a flaccid penis as such. So that's, that's the pain or the problem. So if you correlated with that, which Dr. J, I'm sure you have no issues there. So it oh, probably didn't I would never know. Just, this like, friend I know though, having <laughs> huge problems. Ooh. So if that was you, that would talk to you. So you're a male, it's talking to you in the locker room. It's taking you down the story of I've got a problem here. Then you've got an individual talking you through their journey and the solution that is, which is going online and talk to someone to get some help. So like it is grabber, pain, pleasure, problem, solution, and then you've got a call to action on the end of it. So a harder hitting uh, direct response ad would actually have an offer, a call to action, a discount code or something like that. This call to action was just a website, yeah. which for me is more than enough. If you've got a problem, I'm seeking out information. And I think you're right. They did with the trusted advisor. The guy they picked was perfect because it's a tricky topic, but this guy came with energy, with zest, normal dude, like the kind of guy you didn't feel intimidated by him. You didn't feel embarrassed by him. Just a dude talking. You're kind of like, yeah, all right, I'm with you. Dr. Good. And what I, what I like about it, and I was thinking they may have missed an element here, but in actuality, they've built themselves an element was right now they've got the penis joke. But when they're explaining their website, they say, we can do sexual problems. We do health problems. We do hair problems. We do uh, skin problems, anything with guys. Now what they've just done is they've opened themselves up to any number of opening jokes that can then lead into that same kind of outro. So they've, they've hit the penis, but they've got 10 other things they can do. Next time it's going to be some bald dude and they're going to have a joke about that going back into this. So they found a way that even though it's just about men's health, They've actually piecemealed it in a way that now they can keep hitting one message per ad. Don't overwhelm me with, with ideas and evidence, but then bring in the ad and understand what the business, what the company's going to do at the end. So I, at first I'm like, oh, I'm, men are only going to think this is about sex. But the more I watch it, the more I realize, no, the way they had set up that structure, they can make a dozen of these ads about a dozen different things. And they're still yeah. going to look, look, I'm really excited for this brand. I think this brand has a huge, huge potential I think it's only just warming up. So it's definitely one to watch. And it'd be interesting to see how they, they evolve their creative moving forward. Because I know they do a lot with hair product and sponsoring talent on uh, footy style programming. And they endorse it openly on, on, as content as well. Oh, so, is that I mean, Mosh Hair Products? Yeah, it's the same brand. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, that's interesting as hell. So I like that they're differentiating. But it's, it's funny. We always kind of come to this point where... After you see a good ad, we always say, I can't wait to see what they do next. Because if it, and I think there's a good point to be made in there that a good ad is a good ad that opens the door for you to go further, but that's not where anything ends. You've now got to draw that bow, that line. It's like making a really good film. Now you can make a franchise, but if film two in your franchise sucks, or if you totally change gears and now the characters are different, you've totally lost that momentum from that first piece. Yeah, uh, th there's probably some branding elements that could be strengthened in it. But for me, it was a direct response ad. They're just trying to drive traffic traffic, and acquire new customers. So for me, it ticks all the boxes, like really good ad. Uh, yeah, super excited to see where they're going. But if we're looking at now, changing gears in a, in a very different direction, we've got compare the pair. Boom. And on today's lineup, we've got a big focus on charities. I actually love this compare the pair. This is really good. Yeah. So we've got charities. So the two charities, we've got World Vision and we've got Save the Children, two of the larger not-for-profits globally. And charities, we know they play such an important role in raising funds for people that are in desperate need. So let's look at the two creatives we've got. So the first, World Vision, and then we'll cut to Save the Children and we'll discuss what's good, what's bad, and we'll also have our cast our vote. All right. Over to you, Jake. World Vision, Save the Children. Here we go. Imagine for a second you saw a child who is vulnerable. Well, half of the world's children face violence that's unimaginable. They're frightened, exploited and hurt. It's unacceptable. We can help stop this now and make a child's hope achievable. 
For every child you help, four more are made capable. If you believe all children are educatable, defendable and incredible, help end violence against vulnerable children. If you are willing, they're able. Sponsor a child today. This is a report from Save the Children. These scenes at Chiamala Hospital in Central Africa may look like an emergency, but we see this throughout the world every single day. Among the new arrivals, we found Kayembe. So frail he can no longer stand. Kayembe is almost two years old, but his weight is less than half that of a healthy child his age. <laughs> Kayembe needs food and he needs medicine urgently. These are the basic things that you can help us provide by calling the number on your screen now and giving just two pounds a month. Save the children know what it takes to save a child's life, but we need your help. Because tomorrow, we'll see more children arrive. And the next day. Aussi, il n'y a pas assez de nourriture à donner aux enfants. Les enfants vont mourir. Please pick up the phone now and call 0800 035 6330 or visit our website and give your two pounds a month. For a child as critically ill as Kayembe, a single phone call can make the difference. There we have it. Two ads from World Vision Save the Children. So they're, they're a little bit old now, but uh, for me, I just think it's such a great topic to talk about. It's, it's a space that I've played very heavily in, know it well. And the conversation I'd really like to have is not only the ad that we think is going to have the best performance or the ad that we know has the best performance. I want to dig in and I want to get neuro. I want to go there. Okay. Okay. Well, why don't you kick out? So I think what a good thing to point out is, and I think the audience got this, the big difference is they're, go, they're shooting for the same exact target. It's just one of them has gone with a positive message. Here's the change you can make and what it will look like. The other has gone with the in your face message. Here's how bad it is right now. Here's what's going on. And that's why we need you. So why don't you, you, you start off with your understanding of those two themes with this kind of ad and how those, they typically work. Those themes are important because if you're looking not for profits, they have moved in the direction of a positive feel good ad. For two reasons, it's A, where they want to go from a brand style perspective. There's also some legislation or there's, there's some policy around it as well that they can't actually leverage some of the harder hitting imagery they, they once could. Um, more so in Australia, not so much globally, but in Australia, there's definitely some, some policy around that. But for me, when you're looking at this and I'm looking to raise funds, how do I do it? From when, when I look at this, it's really obvious. This is all about emotion. This is yeah. about allowing the audience to feel what is going on and to resonate with it. I want them to feel pain. Yeah. What's the number one way a viewer is going to feel pain? If I'm looking at not-for-profit, is a child in distress, a child that is in a situation that they should not be in. For me, I'm like, Phew. That is horrible. That should not be happening. I am now charged up. I want to do something. I want to have an impact. That was save the children. Yeah. You resonate with the calls and they flip. So the structure for this ad is pain, pleasure, pain, pleasure. So they show you problem, solution, problem, solution. So the problem is very graphic. It's very visual. And they use all the senses. Yeah. There's visual. The music goes along with it to tell the story. The voiceover is very important to allow you to feel it and sit in it and it takes you on the journey. Then it takes you to a positive. This is what happens when we do the right thing or you support us. Back to pain. Let's get you back there. Let's get the cortisol pumping around. Let you feel it. Let you feel the stress and the tension. Then we'll take you to pleasure again. But if you want pleasure, the real pleasure is supporting this cause and supporting the kids. On the flip side, if you look at world vision, they have some imagery in there that could be a little bit painful. But the music all the way along is this happy track. 
yeah. you know, and it just does not correlate and it does not allow the viewer to feel the pain. So there's no pain, there's no leverage, no leverage mean there's less action. So if you're looking at direct response as such, you want more people to take action, not less, which yeah. means I want more people to feel and then they can take action. And the solution also needs to be simple. So the solution is just $10 a month. A really simple solution. It's something within everyone's realms they contribute. And I really like your quote. It's actually out of your book. Uh oh. So if you're looking at TV contextually, TV predominantly is a relatively happy place, do you know, apart from the news, especially with what's going on now. But in a sea of sadness, joy stands out. But in a sea of joy, sadness wins. Boom. So it's the shift, it's the uncertainty, the unexpected that gets you to you. So let's, let's break this down now neurologically. What's going on inside the brain? So I, I, I guess you've got kind of several mechanisms here. The big ones, the primary one is going to be your empathetic resonance mechanism. So you've probably heard of this concept of mirror neurons, this idea that whenever you watch an action, a behavior happening, you start to imitate that in your own mind as though you're doing it. Now, if you've ever heard of the term mirror neurons, throw that out of your lexicon. There is no such thing as a mirror neuron. Um, that was just a theory we were playing with. In actuality, it's just that we cannot stop ourselves from imitating other people. When I move my hand like this, if I could take a picture of your brain, it would look as though you're moving your hand just like this. That's how we develop empathy. Now, hit me with a kid having a good time drawing, coloring. Boom. I'm going to feel that. I'm going to look like that. I'm going to pretend I'm doing it myself. I'm having a good time. Hit me with a kid who's dying. Oh my goodness. Now I'm going to try to feel like that, but it's going to hurt way too much. And what's going to happen is now I'm going to trigger a stress response. My body, because I'm imitating this pain, is going to start trying to protect itself. And one of the first things that happens when you hit that stress response, and you all felt it when you saw that kid in the beginning of that ad with the ribs, you all felt it guaranteed that initial jolt that goes to your body, that's cortisol flooding through your system. And what happens is in your brain, cortisol moves straight into the memory centers and it says, whatever the heck just caused this, form a deep memory for this. So there's a whole mechanism that goes into it, but all you need to know is when you have that cortisol in the short term, boom, that's something you're going to remember longer. It's a safety mechanism. Your, your system is built to say, if something causes you stress, remember it so that you don't make that same mistake in the future so you can avoid it later. So we've got this kind of dual thing where show me a kid who's having a good time. I'm having a good time. I've been having a good time all night watching my TV shows. It's probably going to come and it's going to go. See you later. Show me a kid who's <laughs> about to pass away. Not only is that going to stick out, but now I'm going to have a real deep memory. And it's going to be real hard for me to get rid of that because of that stress response. So just at the level of memory, this kind of change of pace into pain, huge memory boost for everyone. It's hard to forget those things. The problem is people hate stress. So what tends to happen is after we get a stress response, we try and avoid that stress. We try and shut it down as quickly as possible. I'm not kidding. There was a, an ad just like this one on TV last night with animals. I can only get about 10 seconds into it and I have to turn the station. I will not keep watching it because it feels too uncomfortable for me. So if you're running an ad where you're running that stress, that's your hook, you do very much run the risk of people in the moment saying, nope, nope, shutting down, going away from me. If I can't deal with this stress immediately, I might not deal with this stress at all. And instead, I'm just going to try my best to avoid this stress. So I'd be really curious to see. Intuitively, my thought would be that a very painful, harsh message to see, like the Save the Children one, is would intuitively be more powerful than the Vision Australia. What was the other one? World Vision, World Vision. At, at the in the front end. But if you actually saw the returns on the medium of TV, I'd be really curious to see which is doing better. Because I know live, if I'm walking down the street and you show a dead kid to me and you say, you can help this kid by giving me $10, I'm going to give you $10 right away because that's how I absolve myself from the stress and I keep moving forward. On a TV ad, I can't get rid of it immediately. I have to call somebody. I have to go online. I have to do something with it. And if all I'm trying to do is get away from it, I don't know if that's going to lead me down the track to do this extra work. So live and in person, 
works really well. On TV, I'd be curious to see if it works as well as doing that kind of painful stress stuff in a live situation. Do you have any data or evidence on that, John? This this for not for profits is and historically been one of the most powerful new client acquisition or donor acquisition platforms. Yeah, yeah. Direct response TV is phenomenally powerful. But where people get it right, it is amazing. Where people get it wrong, it falls on its face real fast. So, and it's interesting. So your response to that ad was to, to switch off. Yeah, I can't, I, I hate it. I hate looking at but that imagine, stuff. I hate thinking about imagine it. Imagine that ad and you'd seen it and been exposed to it 10, 15, 20 times. After three or four times, you're probably just like, oh, I've switched a few times. I'm just going to roll through it. Yeah, yeah. So this is where you see the frequency of these ads. That's Especially where it starts to pay. Daytime TV. That's when I always see these suckers. Well, that's oh. where they are because you've got a much higher response rate during usually off-peak TV or daytime TV. So but- I'd be curious to see, you, you, you'd have to come with the pleasure. If you've got the pain, you have to come with the pleasure. Otherwise, those ads might backfire harder. But- because think and- about like the global warming. When they started coming out with all these ads that were just pure global warming, what they found is the more pain they show, most people don't do anything. They need a different route because they just start to feel overwhelmed, like they can't do anything. So as long as you have a call to arms and a kind of positive totally. at the end. So he, here it is with, with pain. Here's a really interesting one. The pain has got to be easy to understand and digest. Yeah. The solution or the pleasure needs to be very, very simple. So this is where malnutrition is the best performing because yeah. I go, they just need some food. Or, so food or water is a very easy solution. As soon as you start getting into complex topics like child sex trade or child labor, it's like, oh, that is like really uncomfortable to watch and understand and see what's going on. But the solution is not, what's my $10 really going to do? Can you actually help someone? Like, what is that actually really going to do? Whereas food and water and sort of your basic needs, it, it, it changes the game quite a bit. So that's where you got to, you got to elicit the pain. It's got to be simple. But the solution has to be easy and simple as well. And that journey has got to be fast. Yeah. So online straight there and you're donating in a matter of minutes rather than a complex client acquisition it's funnel as well. Interesting you say that because when I was growing up, I'm, so I'm in education, of course. So we used to watch ads to support a kid. And so that's what I would always donate to your $10 to sponsor a kid who can't afford school gear or whatever it's going to be. And you reckon your $10 is going to buy this kid school supplies. Now that I'm older and I'm actually in the profession, I realize that ten dollars ain't going anywhere near that kid buying school supplies, and it's a much broader issue. It's not so I can't with knowledge. I've been unable to kind of accept that argument anymore. But before I had any deeper knowledge, I was like, "Yep, it was the very simple ten dollars. I can help. I'm going to help you absolutely." And that's a challenge with not for profits. These these problems they face are incredibly complex. Yeah, it's not just about providing food or water. That is part of it, but it's only a a part of it. Um, there's there's so much more to it. But but if you can the, lock that down, like you said, if if focus on the food, focus on malnutrition, we can tackle the rest in the back. But during an ad, when I'm trying to get people here, let's have a clear set. Boom. One thing we're looking at. The one thing you said there was a sudden or powerful emotional shift. Mm. that I want to focus on. Yep. So if you go back to what we're talking about, that stress response with cortisol, turns out that memory mechanism will kick off any time you have a sudden emotional shift. So if you go from sad to happy, and that's why we were, when you were saying earlier, in a sea of sadness, happiness wins, because any time you shift emotions, you're going to get that. Um, And even if you shift within an emotion, so if you go from kind of, basically happy to ecstatic or kind of sad to pure depressed. Huge emotional swings or emotional shifts trigger off this exact same mechanism. It doesn't require cortisol past this. It, so it's a different memory mechanism up there, neither here nor there. But the idea is that, the, yes, if you can change my emotions, boom, you're going to trigger my memory mechanism. I'm going to hold on to something a little deeper, a little stronger, a little better. So is that where the pain pleasure really comes in? Or if you hit me with pain right at the outset and then show me now that this kid is really happy and doing well, is that shift enough to get me? Well, it's interesting because like norepinephrine is sort of the chemical that you're, you're referring to. Yes. Norepinephrine. Yeah. Yeah. Norepinephrine. So it's easier just to say adrenaline. We'll just adrenaline? simplify it. Yep. Adrenaline. 
So when we're looking at these ads as well, and especially being on the tools and seeing these, the shorter form ads, so being 30, 60 seconds, they never performed anywhere near as well as either like a 90 or a 120 or a longer form. So you've got the story arc in there that you can tell the story, but it's nearly like you really need to let the audience feel it and immerse themselves in it and then also take them to the solution. So it's it's a longer form. So that's kind of why... And, and again, you go, it's a simple message. You get their attention from the outset, but it's literally by that sudden or powerful emotional shift. Yeah. And if you, I wonder if, if you're right, is in a 10 second, in a 30 second ad, can you feel the counter emotion? I, I know I can feel disgust in 15 seconds because I feel anytime I see that kid or those dogs getting hurt, I feel disgust immediately. Can you swing my disgust into joy in 30 seconds? Probably not. Because disgust is a huge emotion. Can you flip it in 60 seconds? You got a much better shot because you have a lot more time to actually show me the benefits and get me to forget that disgust as, as quickly as you can. So I, I, it's, it's, it's possible to do it on the fly. And we do it all the time. I mean, if you ever are just walking on the street and you see some dude slip and you start cracking up, that's a huge emotional shift. So it happens on the fly all the time. It's just really hard to set up an emotion and then really quickly switch that emotion on somebody. Totally. On, on the, I'll, I'll add this as a caveat though. So if you're not for profit and there's a disaster going on or something, there's, there's an event that people are familiar with or aware of. They already have an emotion attached with it. So right now, if you go COVID in a, a third world country, they know COVID and they just go, wow, the impact of that. So the setup of the ad can be quite fast. Yeah. So, or it's an earthquake or it's a tsunami people are aware of it. They've already been educated on it. So it's just boom, I'm already there, then set up the solution. So for me, you can absolutely deliver that in a 30 second creative because you don't really need to bring them into this deep, dark world or shift them in this powerful way. Cause you've got, I'm aware of that problem. I want to support it and I want to get behind it. So that's you've the only caveat them. with not-for-profits. Yeah. Well, I wonder, we should take a look at the, well, I guess they're older ads, but if everyone is switching into the more positive, there must be a reason for it. Are they finding better returns on the positive or is it just a movement or? Movement. They're definitely not finding better returns. That is for sure. Dang. Cause it's, it's hard to get some, if someone's feeling good, it's hard to get them to donate money. It's more around. We don't want to show, you know, especially children as objects of pity or, you know, it's kind of leveraging them in, in yeah. they're using them to try and raise funds. Like it, it, it's, it's a, it's a very big conversation, but that but is they very much. That they're exploiting kids to raise Correct. money for. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting too. I think there's another big whole side movement beyond that, where recently we've come to recognize that a lot of the bigger charities, your money wasn't going into the kids at all. Like 80% of it was going to salaries to keep fundraising. And so there's, with that kind of pushback, I think a lot of, Companies have now realized we can't, <laughs> we've got to kind of change the entire image of this system. We can't keep doing the same. Otherwise, people will think we're one of the big charities. We're just stealing your money. See you later. Yeah, absolutely. But the one thing that everyone should take away is when you're looking at emotion, you've got to allow the audience to feel. Yeah. So the more they can feel, the more they can resonate. But also you're talking about memory, you know, the deeper the memory. And as we're talking about feelings, let's look at one of the cr classic creatives. So this is five gum. Oh, we went with five gum. Yeah. We've gone five gum. Love so it. So we're talking about feelings and allowing the audience to feel. It's time for a blast from the past. Five gum and the bouncing balls. Jared, this was your suggestion from the other week. We've pulled it out of the archives. Dude, if you have a chance, go watch all the 510. There's, there's dozens of them, or five gum. There's dozens of them. 
And this is what they do. Go back to our mirroring. We feel things. We empathize. And last week, we were talking about the juicy corn. If you see an arid desert with some juicy corn squishing out, you can actually, if I can look at the sensory portions of your brain, you are tactically feeling that. You are tasting that corn in that moment. Not as extreme as if you were actually eating corn, but enough that the brain starts to change and adapt as though it were real. Five Gum did the best of this. All they did was tap into as many different senses as they could with a really low rumbling bass. In this instance, bass. Really smooth balls. It was all about the texture of those balls. You could see this dude's hair blowing the coolness. When it's happening, you've never felt that before, but you have. You've, you've laid on a, a trampoline before. You've played with the... You know what it's feeling like. And they say, there you go. That's your five gum. All we're going to do is get you to feel sensorily feel sensations. And we're going to then say, that's what it's like. And I think that's such a cool, because you can't tell me what your gum tastes like. So what are you going to do instead? I'm going to give you a whole different experience and just say, now link that to my gum and go have a good time. I, I don't know a single person when these were coming out. There were some that had liquid like splashing through filters to get onto people's faces. And you're always like, oh, I could taste that. Oh my God, that's incredible. And they did it. The fact that they did it so repetitively too. What does it feel like to chew five gum at the front? Five gum from Wrigley at the end. Now you can put anything you want in the middle. And it became a meme. People just started putting random shit. So online, they would have the opening, what it feels like to chew five gum. Then they would cut to a clip of their friend getting kicked in the nuts. Then they'd say <laughs> five gum from Wrigley. Anything that was about sensation started to just be plugged into this format. And I honestly, when this started coming out, I don't remember, I don't know anyone who didn't go buy five gum. I remember talking about it in the office. I was in Boston and we all tried it. It was nasty. I only, I only tried it once. It wasn't a good product, but we all had to go try it because those commercials were just so dang compelling. They were. And like, just to, to echo what you said then, like the one that really burns in my mind was... I think it was the the cinnamon gum that came out, but in the ad, it was this lady like in free fall and she was over all these fire jets and yeah, you can yeah. see her face just starting to go a bit red, but as you can do it and they're talking about the cinnamon flavor and it's slightly hot and this is how it feels. And you just, I feel my whole body just sort of warm up, but immediately I'm, I'm kind of tasting this, this warm cinnamon in my mouth as, as she starts to glow and you're just like, wow. The obvious way would have been just someone walking down a street and you see this explosion in their mouth. Yeah. Whereas what they've done is elicited all the senses in your body to feel it everywhere rather than just focus on the taste buds. And it's interesting how you can do that without being so overt. And it, sh it shows you how you start watching, paying attention to good films versus mediocre films. The good ones, you will feel the temperature. Like if you're in the Arctic, they'll find ways to make you feel that coldness. And it doesn't have to be like you said, like these dramatic snowstorm, just seeing the crystals of snow while hearing wind, and then maybe someone's hand coming in to scoop it up. When you start to get the tactate, and again, at some point, there has to be a human being there for you to start mirroring it. So if all you do is show me a cold spot, I can think about cold, cool. But if you show me a person in cold, how they're reacting, their skin bubbling up, now I will start to mirror that. And that's how I start to feel that chill. I immediately just thought of, is it sore where they're trapped in a room and they've got to try and get out? Yeah. Yeah. And they've got these horrible things where they're like cutting off their own legs and everything else like that. And they all have gross, like, so I remember one of those saw, this is like 10 saw movies now where one was like in a bunch of pig guts and stuff, but you, cause now you're getting disgusted cause it's in his mouth and stuff. And you're like, no, no. That's what we do. It's a way I always think about it like this is people say, okay, film is a visual or an auditory medium. And all I say is, nope, just go watch any clip of a kid wiping out on a skateboard. Everyone's reaction will be, oh, that's not because that's what we're trained to do. That's because in that moment, you don't have a choice. You're mirroring that kid. And when the kid falls off the skateboard, you flinch at the pain. You didn't get the pain, but you flinched at it because your brain was trying to send it to you. Film is a sensual medium as well as anything else. If you play it right, we will mirror your actors. We will mirror your characters. You can get us to taste, smell things that don't exist because you've done it well on screen. And that's, and that's why I think they did so well here. So does that, just before we wrap up, so talking sudden and powerful emotional shift, does that have to do with like feeling emotion? Like does that, just for everyone out there, does memory... Do deeper memories form when emotion is present or it's the emotional shift 
where deeper memories form. Yeah. So you tend to say emotions are always on. So emotion itself doesn't lead to deep memories. It's the mechanisms behind those emotions. When you do emotional shifts, that kicks off the mechanism, off you go. When you click into stress, that kicks off the mechanism, off you go. So anyone who says emotions are everything, not when it comes to memory, not really. It's the emotional shifts or what those emotions cause you to do that then later lead to that deep memory. So a good rule of thumb is, is this, is <laughs> let's say you have a car wreck. Today you have two events. You got in a car wreck and you bought a new hat. What are you more likely to talk about with your friends tomorrow when they say, hey, how was your day? You're going to bring up the car wreck. That recall of that memory is what led to the deeper memory. And why were you more apt to recall it? Because during the, the wreck, you had an enough of emotional boost that triggered this memory system. And now that said, kind of imprinted it and said, I want you to recall, think about this later. So it's not the, I know this sounds weird, but it's not the emotion itself. It's what does that emotion cause you to do later is where we get our deeper memories. And if the emotion doesn't cause you to do those things, you could have the most emotional thing in the world and you won't remember it. But just on the emotion, so is it just the emotion or sorry, the shift, but do you also need say stress and then safety to? No, when it comes to stress, stress can stand on its own. Disgust can stand on its own. Um, and largely anger can stand on its own. But the other ones, joy, sadness, surprise kind of require Actually, I would put surprise in instead of anger. Sadness, happiness, anger require more. Surprise is enough that that can kick off a mechanism. Disgust is usually enough to kick it off on its own too. Um, but yeah, so that's why we think if you're, if you're dealing with attention, it's all kind of about the grab the attention, the surprise. Because if you can get that surprise jolt, congratulations, you have me. But if you're trying to play with something like joy or sadness or depression, you've got a lot more you have to do the swing. You have to have the pain pleasure to film, form that deeper memory. Very, very interesting. Well, Dr. J, as always, thank you for your contribution and also just helping educate everyone in terms of what's going on inside our brain as we're exposed to these type of creatives. So episode nine, it's a wrap. Thank you for tuning in. Jonathan Rowley, Dr. J, tuning out. Till next time.